Okay, welcome all. We're gonna wait just a few moments before we get started. Okay. okay, well, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, this is the first of our end of life education series. We're doing three more Wednesdays. And this is hosted by the Older Adult Behavioral Health Initiative of Josephine and Jackson County in Oregon. Uh, just a few etiquette things to go over and for CEUs, um, we ask you to please mute your mic. Uh, you can utilize the chat for questions and comments. We're gonna have a question and answer period after Susan speaks. So you can either save them or go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, slides and the recording will be available to you. Um, and then if you are looking to uh, get CEUs, your live attendance is required. Uh, to claim the CEUs for today's course, you are gonna need to complete the survey that we send to you. And then if you would like a certificate of attendance, we will be sending a survey from PSU uh, asking you how the training went today and some other questions. And we will send all these surveys to you um, in a follow-up email. So I wanted to go over the Older Adult Behavioral Health uh, Initiative. It was created in 2015 by the Oregon Health Authority and it gives 24 specialist uh, assignments throughout the state of Oregon, and we have one or more counties for each of us, and we are contracted and co-located at community mental health organizations. Uh, we created the initiative to address the unique needs of older adults and people with disabilities with behavioral health needs, and specialists engage in collaborations and coordination in the systems of care, help build knowledge capacity through free workforce training, and also community education. And we also provide complex case consultations. So if you wanna learn more about the initiative, uh, you can go to OregonBHI.org. And today we have uh, myself, Linda Jowens for Josephine County, and we have Janine Greenwell uh, for Jackson County. So if you don't know your specialists in your county and you are located in Oregon, uh, they are an amazing resource. And like I said, we have three more uh, workshops that we're gonna be giving for June. So you can still register for those through our Eventbrite website. And so I want to go ahead and introduce today um, addressing psychological distress at end of life with our wonderful presenter, Susan Headland. She is the Director of Patient and Family Support Services at the OHSU Knight Cancer Institute. And Susan has been an oncology social worker for 30 years and specializes in the development and provision of psychosocial support services for people with cancer and their loved ones. Currently, she supervises adult oncology social workers at OHSU and coordinates wellness offerings of yoga, mindfulness-based stress reduction, exercise, massage, and retreats for people with cancer. And previously, she directed the Cancer Counseling Program at Cancer Care Resources, and also directed the Palliative Care Program at Hospice and Palliative Care of Washington County. So she has spoken and written extensively about the impact of cancer on individuals and families and on palliative and end-of-life care, is a senior scholar for the Center of Ethics at OHSU, and is a past president of the Association of Oncology Social Work. So we are really excited to have her um, with us today. And I will give this over to Susan. Thank you so much, Angela, for such a warm introduction. And it's so fun to be able to um, 
participate in something that expands the state here. Um, I think that's one benefit that we've learned during COVID is that we can do a lot virtually and connect from, from far and wide. I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen here and you're gonna to have to tell me if uh, you are able to see it. Are you seeing it, Angela? Yes. Excellent, thank you. I'll move this to um, the slide show version here. Um, I was saying to Angela as we were we were um, speaking a little bit before going live here that end of life care is is for me one of the most meaningful kinds of work that we can do whether we're um, physicians nurses um, uh, home health aides social workers chaplains um, providers of care for loved ones uh, I think that uh, if if we are available and able to be attentive to end of life care, it can profoundly not only enhance the end of life care experience for the person who is dying and their loved ones, but I also believe it can really give us rich perspective on our own lives and what's important. So what I wanna talk about today are some of the themes that commonly come up at the end of life that I, I'm sure many of you have witnessed um, and we'll leave plenty of time at the end to have a discussion as well. Um, but I really want to dedicate this talk to my dear friend, Bobby. Um, Bobby was a colleague and friend, a social worker who I worked with at Hospice of Washington County, former student of mine who uh, at age um, 58 was diagnosed with a stage four glioblastoma. And um, over the course of her illness, um, I had the privilege of sitting with her every week, every Wednesday afternoon, um, and she lived for, for four and a half years. And for any of you who know that diagnosis, that seemed unbelievable to us because the average life expectancy is about 18 months with a, a stage four glioblastoma. And we all have speculated about why she lived so long, including her oncologist and her palliative care doctor and myself. But part of it was just the grace with which she lived her life. She was a meditation practitioner for more than 40 years and uh, managed to navigate a pretty significant disability with more grace than I think anyone I've ever witnessed. And um, I really wanna keep her at the heart of this presentation because I learned so much from sitting with her each week, even when she could no longer speak. And so with that, I, I'd like to, to acknowledge that today, I'd like to consider the psychological themes that people go through try to talk a little bit about how we recognize symptoms of distress in patients at the end of life, and then to consider some of the strategies that might help ease suffering and distress for people who are facing the end of their lives. Some of the basics that I think remain pretty universal over time is that people who are dying need to be treated as living human beings. Um, and I think that I, I hear that all the time from people who work in hospice is that, that it's, yes, it's about dying, but it's also about living. And it's about living as well as one can uh, as, as they are facing the end of their days. There's also a need to maintain a sense of hopefulness, even if the, the focus of hope may change over that course of time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The need to be cared for by those who can maintain a sense of hopefulness and hopefully to die with peace and dignity as the individual defines that. We also know that in working with people who are dying, we want to, as much as is possible, alleviate suffering, reduce isolation, um, sometimes facilitating life review, and try to address the worries that the person who is dying and their loved ones have as the time unfolds. Some of the themes that are really normal and very common are grief, sadness, and loss. You know, the person who is dying is losing everything, uh, losing their lifestyle, losing perhaps their employment or their vocation. Sometimes people feel like they're losing some of their identity, maybe losing some of the roles that they previously played, um, but also have to face saying goodbye to everyone and everything. You know, those who love the person who is dying are anticipating the loss of that person, but the dying person is losing so much. And often we also see that people who are dying are, are really dealing with the loss of the future. 
how often I've heard people say that they waited and waited and waited until retirement, finally retired, we're excited about living some of those dreams, and then we're diagnosed with some devastating illness. Or some people are diagnosed with devastating illnesses earlier in life that may interrupt all the developmental uh, transitions that one might have expected. The loss of perhaps not seeing your children grow up or missing anticipated events that you'd looked forward to, such as the marriage of children or the birth of grandchildren. For some people, uh, they may wrestle with guilt or self-blame. Uh, for some, again, anger, frustration, uh, some people, not all, may feel a sense of why me or some bitterness about that. And certainly for many, they fear being a burden and creating a dependency on others that they feel will be too much. Now, I think it's important, this list, not everyone will experience each of these things, but these are pretty common themes that you will see in working with people who are dying, and they may change as time goes on. Uh, people may reconcile some of these issues, but these are not uncommon to see with people who are dying. Other things are the fear of abandonment, whether that's by a family or other loved ones or by their healthcare providers. You know, that sense of who's gonna be here for me, who's gonna walk with me. And as I mentioned, for some, it's the loss of self-esteem or identity or a sense of dignity, uh, fears of death or the process of dying. For others, it might be existential or religious concerns. And, and still others really wanna set things right um, to have an opportunity for reconciliation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that with some specific examples as, as this talk unfolds. And then some very practical concerns such as unfinished business with relationships, getting our wills or our other affairs in order. Um, there might be child custody issues, planning for funerals or memorials, planning for financial uh, and estate issues as well. For depending on the disease, now cancer is just one, we know there are many, many other illnesses, congestive heart failure, dementias, uh, a whole range of neurological diseases. They may be um, punctuated by a whole variety of stages throughout the disease itself. There may be remissions and relapses like you see in oncology, can the cancer world, or you may see um, people who, uh, whose diseases are, are, are progressing so that people are getting worse as time goes on and losing more physical or cognitive abilities. And the longer the, the, longer the disease goes on, the more you may see a lengthened periods, periods of anticipatory grief, increased financial, social, or physical pre pressures, longer term family disruption, progressive declines, and dilemmas about decision-making and treatment. Um, it, it, in the early stages uh, following a, a difficult diagnosis, often people experience a lot of support uh, from, from family and communities around them. The longer the disease goes on, the more typical it is for people's support to go away. Um, and that can become really isolating. And we certainly saw that during COVID, um, that COVID itself was isolating, but for people who were already navigating serious illnesses in their families, uh, that became pretty difficult. So Eric Cassell, who did a lot of writing a number of years ago about the goals of medicine, suggested that as medical caregivers, it is our obligation to relieve suffering. But what we certainly know is that suffering is not combined to physical symptoms. Suffering can occur both from the disease, suffering can be a result of the treatment itself, but suffering is also very subjective. And so it may be psychological or spiritual suffering uh, that people are experiencing as they, they lose other parts of their functional abilities and identity. I had a dear friend and mentor a colleague who just died last month uh, following um, a long cancer history, but also a series of strokes. And he made a living teaching, mentoring, and um, being a phenomenal clinician. And one of the strokes knocked out his speech center, which uh, for him was so much a part of his identity. And so watching him try to hold on to some sense of dignity after so much functional decline uh, was, was challenging. 
The other thing that um, is important to keep an eye on working with people at the end of life um, is that there, there can exist some significant depression and being able to recognize that and know what to do about it can be helpful. So I wanna talk a little bit about depression and how we evaluate and treat it. I wanna talk a little bit about hope, a little bit about exploring meaning. And then I'll also suggest some models for how we promote hope and meaning making at the end of life. So depression isn't a given for seriously ill patients. However, the data suggests that about 25% of our seriously ill patients will at some point in time experience depression. Now, some of our patients come to us with pre-existing histories of depression or anxiety, um, but about 25% of seriously ill patients may experience depression over the course of their illness. And it has an increased prevalence as, as great as up to 77% in patients with advanced diseases. Now, again, um, it, it's important to recognize that these studies, the reason there's such a wide variation in prevalence is that the studies are done fairly differently. And so they're not always, we're not always able to compare them with one another. There's sometimes some apples and oranges as we look at the data. But we do know that people who have advanced diseases may be at greater risk for depression, particularly some diseases more than others, such as um, Lewy body dementia. We also know that people with pancreatic cancer have much higher rates of depression, which does not appear related to the prognosis, but rather to some of the things going on organically. But we also know that unrelieved pain goes hand in hand with major depression. And so it's really important for those of us who work with the dying to work collaboratively with our care teams, physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, to really evaluate do we have symptoms that are unrelieved that could be contributing to overall distress and perhaps depression? The other thing that we know um, is that, that people who are dying face many existential changes, or excuse me, challenges, including death, isolation, Irvin Yalom, who is a longtime uh, psychiatrist who worked, worked doing a lot of existential work with his clients, suggested that dying with a sense of meaninglessness um, can create an incredible amount of distress for people who are dying. So we want to help people claim and create a sense of meaning both in their living and their dying, if that's possible. The other thing that I think is important to mention is that it is not uncommon for people at the end of life to offer what Ruth Ann Van Loon suggests are desire to die statements. It's really important to tease out what those mean. We live in one of the states, as you know, that has um, legalized um, um, assisted death in certain cases. But people who are dying may express the desire to die, and it may not mean that they want to hasten that. Uh, it just may mean, according to Van Loon, several things. It may be an expression or depression or suicidal ideation, or it may be a way of coping. Um, I remember working at hospice with a woman who was 103, and each time I would visit her, she would say, Susan, why am I still here? Why can't I just go and get this over with? And you know, for her, that was just, you know, she wasn't suicidal, she wasn't depressed, she was just trying to figure out why she was still here and find a way of coping with that. Um, it can also be either an expression of a spiritually based acceptance of death or um, a, a readiness. My, my dad, when he was 92, kept saying, I've lived a great life. If I die tomorrow, that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm ready. Um, and then for others, it's still others, it may be that they do want to pursue uh, a death with dignity under certain circumstances. But where we want to keep an eye on things is if, if it reflects a significant depression or other symptoms that are unrelieved that we can attend to. One of the things that's a little bit tricky is to differentiate between normal grief at the end of life versus significant depression. Um, grief, again, is a normal part of working through uh, serious illnesses and dealing with the functional losses along the way. And sometimes depression and grief look pretty similar, um, but I think it's important to tease out some of the distinctions. So with grief, 
the feelings and the emotions are resulting from the losses along the way. And many people who are terminally ill do experience grief. And it's often associated with disease progression and, and losing more ability. Um, however, in grief, usually people are able to retain a capacity for pleasure. So there's still things that people may enjoy despite all the losses along the way. And grief comes in waves. So people who are grieving usually have some moments of joy, usually have an ability to be consoled and can look forward to some of the future. So, you know, when I'm working with someone who's dying, I will often ask the question, are there still things that you look forward to? Are there still some things that bring you joy? And that gives you a lot of information about their perspectives. With depression, on the other hand, um, the feelings and emotions may fit the criteria for major depression, which I'll, I'll map out in just a moment. But as I mentioned, pain is a major risk factor. And another indicator of, of depression versus grief is that there's nothing that people enjoy at all. You know, even a grandchild's visit or something that generally would bring some joy. If it doesn't, it may suggest that someone is pretty depressed. And, uh, and depression usually is not relieved. It's usually unremitting, And people that you often don't have a real sense of a positive future. Some of the things we use to assess whether someone is significantly depressed if they have an advanced disease is to have a depressed mood most of the day and on most days, a diminished pleasure in most activities, sleep and appetite disturbances, although that's a less reliable one with significant illnesses because sleep and appetite disturbances may be pretty common. Um, and the slowing or, or psychomotor slowing or agitation and we often see a sense of worthlessness, hopelessness, and guilt. Uh, I'm working with a person right now who is extremely depressed and she continues to talk about her sense of worthlessness and guilt and continues to have, I think, a perspective that the world and her children in particular would be better off without her, which I think is some of the distorted thinking that can go on with significant depression. So some of the questions that are useful in assessing for some of this are just things like, how well do you feel like you're coping? That can help you get to a sense of well-being. How are your spirits? You know, and, and that can help you understand, is there ever some relief from some of these spirits? And this is probably one of the most important questions you can ask. Are there still things you enjoy? So again, even people who are grieving, people who are at the end of their lives generally can tell you, I still love sitting in my garden. I still love cuddling with my dog. I love it when my grandkids are here. Um, and that is probably the most reliable question you can ask when you're trying to tease out, is this grief or is this depression? And how does the future look to you? You know, people, and I'll talk about hope in just a little bit. Um, but even people who are dying have things that they may hope for. It may be hope for a pain-free night. It may be hope for one last Christmas season, maybe hope for uh, living long enough to attend a child's wedding, things like that. We also know that uh, helplessness is, can contribute to depression and a sense of being a burden can contribute to that as well. And then that question of, do you feel like others might be better off without you? That's a tricky one to tease out because for people who have become increasingly dependent, they may genuinely believe that their loved ones are better off without them. But if you invite the family into the room, you know, they may acknowledge that caregiving is hard, but that they still very much want their loved one to be near them. So for, for depression, the thing that, that we know to be really helpful is a combination of counseling and medication. So supportive counseling for some people, psychotherapy and, and medication can be really, really helpful uh, in working with people who are dying. And the counseling approaches for any of you who are trained as mental health professionals can include things like cognitive behavioral techniques, exploration of life review and what we call legacy building and all of us can contribute to that and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the um, uh, how we do that but we also need to understand cultural differences of people that we work with there may be people who are very open to talking about their sadness uh, or their grief there may be others who feel like the most important thing that they can do is tough it out and be really stoic 
uh, or they may be from a culture that does not support um, it, you know, being uh, expressing depression or other, other kinds of, of uh, emotional reactions. And so those are important things to assess as well. So we really want to address pain and other physical symptoms such as dyspnea or other things that may be contributing to a poorer quality of life. We may want to understand what the patient perceives to be happening. Uh, I can't tell you how many times over the years patients have been prescribed adequate pain medication, but they aren't taking it as prescribed for fear that they will run out of options should things get worse or for fear of addiction. Um, and so those are things to try to tease out and maybe do some teaching about that we know that adequate pain relief comes from uh, taking pain medications on a regularly scheduled basis rather than for waiting for the breakthrough pain and then trying to catch up with it. So we wanna clarify what the person's perception is we want to help people communicate with their caregivers about what their needs are, examine the adequacy of social support. We know that people who are less isolated do better than those who are really isolated. And then we might want to consider um, offering some individual uh, therapy. Um, meditation can be really helpful, existential therapy. And complementary therapies we've, we've learned can be really helpful. Some uh, end of life care programs offer things like massage, uh, music therapy, or other things that can give a sense of relief as people um, navigate the, the unknowns and the challenges of the end of life experience. But most importantly, compassion is everything. And that is something that whether we're professionally trained or serving in a volunteer capacity, uh, that, that it can be one of the most important things that we bring to this end of life experience. Uh, all through my career, I've been fascinated by the role of hope, um, especially the role of hope in a, a terminal illness, which may seem counterintuitive. You know, how can one remain hopeful if one is dying? And, and the, I read an article early in my career that, that talked about how um, healthcare providers can contribute to or conversely take away the hope uh, from, from people that, that they're providing care for, even if the prognosis is poor. So I, I, I've been studying hope my whole career because I think it's fascinating. And hope is defined as the belief that things are obtainable, even if that's really remote. And the hoping person expects to gain some good in the future that is personally meaningful. With terminal illness, a lot of the literature suggests that we all need hope. All of us who are alive need it. And I would suggest during these challenging couple of years that we've been through, that's no less true for us as it is for our patients. We need hope. We need hope for the future, uh, for our quality of life to be enhanced. And, and for some people who are dying, we must help provide, pro protect that hope and, and support their sense of meaning. And for others, a new vision of hope needs to be created. Viktor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning after being um, imprisoned in a concentration camp, talked about how we can only answer to life by answering for our own lives. And so that comes back to that notion of, is our, do we feel like our lives were meaningful? And do we feel like our dying is meaningful? So uh, again, Franco talks about focusing on hope on the future and the expectation of change and creating new meanings, uh, rendering it more acceptable. Sister Karen Defoe, who I worked with early in my career, uh, was the cancer program administrator at Providence Portland and wrote her doctoral uh, dissertation on the role of hope for cancer patients. And what she talked about building on Frankel's model uh, were both what they, she called generalized hope and particularized hope. What Frankel talked about in the concentration camps were that the people who somehow didn't give up uh, under the, the horrendous circumstances that they endured, uh, in the beginning, they they were hopeful for being free to the camps, being hope, hopeful for reuniting with family and returning home. And he observed that when those hopes were no longer possible, that the people who didn't give up moved into a sense of generalized hope, meaning perhaps humankind will learn from this. Perhaps there will become some deeper meaning uh, and greater good at the end of all of this, even if I don't know what that looks like. 
So Sister Karen Defoe uh, applied this to cancer programs and said, you know, one of the things that particularized hope uh, uh, served was to clarify and prioritize uh, and affirm what the person perceived as important. And so that might be things like, in the beginning, hope to be cured of their, your disease, hope to go into long periods of remission, you know, hope to stay out of pain. Whereas generalized hope were, were, were hopes around, maybe I can learn and reprioritize something from uh, the experience that, that I am going through, or maybe my family will become closer somehow. So at the end of life, what we know is that, that our patients confront many issues um, that aren't amenable to change. So if they are dying, it means giving up on the desire for cure or um, that some new treatment uh, miracle will come along soon enough to help. So how do we promote hope at the end of life that is realistic but attainable? There's a wonderful book that uh, Jerome Groupman wrote called The Anatomy of Hope. And he's an oncologist who frankly didn't believe that hope was very valuable until he learned about it from his sickest patients. And, and he talked about how hope and was nurturing hope was a strategy that helped allay anxiety and depression and fear in situations where they, there were no direct problem solving options. So some of the hope themes for our particularly sick patients can be everything from being discharged from the hospital. I work in a very busy acute care medical center where sometimes our sickest patients may be with us for weeks to months. And certainly being able to finally be discharged uh, may be a really prevalent hope for those patients. Or it may be a regarding illness and functioning, being able to stabilize and attain certain goals, being treated with dignity, it may have religious or spiritual connotations, um, to live, and not die, uh, or it may be about the circumstances of death, dying, and burial. And for some patients, it is actually to die. You know, my 103-year-old was really ready, um, and so she hoped to die, um, even though she wasn't depressed. So for us, when the prognosis is particularly bad, I think we need to find ways to help the person deal with the prognosis and alternatives for treatment without destroying all hope. And I think, again, we can do this by reassuring the patient that he or she will not be abandoned, that their symptoms will be attended to, and by emphasizing some hopeful measures. I, I was asked to write a chapter uh, in a, a, a clinical cancer ethics textbook a number of years ago on the role of hope with cancer. And I chose to interview a bunch of my patients about hope and one of the people I interviewed was a physician himself who had been diagnosed with multiple myeloma and had been treated with a bone marrow transplant. And he, he, he gave a really poignant example of how he would go see his bone marrow transplant doctor and come away pretty devastated about, about the prognosis and, and what may lay ahead in the future. And he would come from his medical oncologist's office and say, I got the exact same medical information, but came away with a sense of hope. And I said, well, what was it in the, in, in the difference? You know, it wasn't that she was denying the reality of, of the data, but he said, well, I just felt like she was still there with me. She hadn't given up on me, even though the prognosis was so poor. Um, and so we see both, we, we see both ends of the spectrum with hope. We've got providers who, you know, I, I deny the prognosis and are unrealistically hopeful, or you've got providers who kind of uh, are, are so grim in their delivery that people feel like giving up right then. What I would suggest is something in the middle is what's most helpful. So I've changed the name here, but this was a physical therapist who I worked with who was age 39 when her breast cancer reoccurred. And as a physical therapist, she understood what, what her prognosis was. And she said that telling me everything would be all right when I suspected it was not, uh, would, was not helpful to me, but telling me the truth, but kindly, and re reassuring me that I wouldn't be abandoned gave me hope. It gives a person with a terminal disease a chance to see oneself as having some control versus being a victim of an impending death sentence. And it's a wonderful, wonderful gift. And so one of the ways you can work with that is to just say, are there still things that 
you still want to do? Are there still dreams you want to accomplish? And what might it take in order to do that? Are there still, um, are there still things you do have control over or people that you want to see uh, that are still attainable? And how might you use this time to shed a light on what's most important to you? Um, I've heard many people who aren't sick say that the experience of, of the last two years has given them an opportunity to really reprioritize prioritize what's truly most important in our lives. When I, I take cancer patients on weekend retreats, that's often what we're doing is resetting what our priorities are. Another thing that I think we can do at the end of life with the people that we're working with is help them create stories. So that doesn't require a, a, a clinical degree. Uh, all it requires is showing up and listening and asking a lot of questions. So there's a lot of work in my field that talk about what we call illness narratives. So it's, it's how people tell us about what's happening to them. And, and this ethnographer talks about how we develop stories as a way of understanding and making sense of our generations. Certain cultures, Native American cultures and others, uh, really in African cultures, uh, uh, tell stories as a way of creating meaning and passing on uh, values through generations. And, and it, it is a way of making sense of ourselves and our place in the world. So I often will ask the people that I'm working with, how do you make sense of what you're going through? You know, how do you make sense of, of your illness? What's changed for you? Um, have there been any gifts? You know, there's certainly been a lot of losses. And those open-ended questions can really uh, enrich your experience. You know, things like you're working with an elderly person whose spouse is dying and you might say, how did you two meet anyway? And how did you know she was the one? Boy, will that give you a lot of information. And, and it's a way of doing life review and inviting people to tell me about you. Tell me what's important to know about you. Illness narratives can help people explain illness to themselves and can sometimes help them find meaning. Uh, over, over the years, some of my patients have said, you know, I'd never wish this on anybody, but it has sure, sure changed my perspectives and again, helped me reprioritize what's most important. And in, in the end of life care, some of these stories can bring patients to their epiphanies. I will tell you about a gentleman that uh, wasn't a patient of mine. He was the father of my next door neighbor. The, uh, my next door neighbor and her mother were providing care for her father uh, who was also experiencing an end-stage brain tumor. And I, I would go over to their house every Wednesday night just to, just like, I, oh, I just realized that connection. Bobby I went to on Wednesdays and this gentleman I went to on Wednesdays as well. Um, and I was just providing respite so that mom and daughter could, could get a break, go do, have dinner together. And I would sit with him. It was during baseball season. And so we were watching the World Series together and I'd feed him and talk with him. And in the middle of, of one of these evenings, he looked at me and said, do you think my life mattered? Do you think my family will remember me? Do you think they will forgive me? And the backstory here was that he hadn't been a great husband or father. He was a longtime alcoholic, had been pretty mean and, and you know, verbally pretty abusive over the years to his family. And here he was at the end of his life trying to make sense of it and trying to uh, see if they would forgive them. And Ira Bayak, you know, when he talks about the, um, the, the four invitations around saying, I'm sorry, I forgive you, I love you, do you forgive me? Those are some of the themes that are, are, are really helpful. So we talked a little bit about his regret about not having been a great husband or father. And again, I wasn't there as his therapist. I was there just to offer some respite. So I asked him, I said, do you think you can share those things with your family? And he, he said, I don't know, I'll try. And I said, I hope you'll try. And then, and then I asked if you end up not being able to, may I share these stories with them? And he said, yes. And a few short weeks later, he did die. I, he never had the conversation with them. But the night that he died, I told his wife and his daughter what he had shared with me about his regret and how much he loved them. And he hoped that they would, would remember that he loved them. And so I share that as one of those kind of epiphany moments of, 
um, you know, those un unfolding stories can help people try to achieve some peace at the end of life. Some of my support groups, I've had several support groups over the years for people with very serious illnesses. And I've watched with wonder at how people teach each other, you know, about how she taught me how to die. Uh, I, I have a, a writing workshop for women with cancer at, at, in my program. And the writing facilitator yesterday shared with me that one of their members had, had died this week. And the outpouring from the support group members was profound in, in saying, you know, I'm much less afraid. I feel like my family will be okay when it's my turn. Um, but for others, when the meaning is less accessible, you may see more anger around, it's not fair, I'm bitter, I feel like God has abandoned me. And that reconciliation with one's faith and one's God may be a part of the journey as well. And I, I think what's really important to say here is it's not up to us to provide those answers but we can, we can wear, bear witness to the questions as our patients arrive at their own answers. I think it's really important to remember that it's their question, it's their journey. And as much as we want, may want to uh, step in and answer the question for them, that's not our job. Our job is to really uh, sit with the questions with them and to help them explore it. That asking questions like what might help you come to terms with some of these unreconciled questions. Do you need to talk to your chaplain or your rabbi or your priest? Uh, would that be a helpful thing to do? So there are a few options, resources out there that, um, that can help us with some of these, these challenging issues. Um, there's uh, a model called meaning-centered therapy. Uh, it's for patients near the end of life. And it is, uh, uh, was created by Bill Breitbart, who's the chief of psychiatry at a big cancer center in New York, Memorial Sloan Kettering. And it, it's an eight week group for patients with advanced cancers, the goal of helping identify multiple sources of meaning that still exist in their life despite the illness and helping them to develop some more flexible ways to think about meaning. That meaning may not just be tied to my high power job as, as a, uh, a, a Wall Street attorney um, or you know, some other identity that comes with our livelihoods, but meaning may be uh, defined by uh, the legacy we give our kids, the legacy that we leave for the friends in our lives or the people who are important to us. And so those are some of the things that, that we can think about. And you don't have to do a structured eight-week group in order to bring these principles uh, into our work with our patients. One that uh, I've been trained in and others have probably been exposed to that I really love is called Dignity Therapy. Um, and Dignity Therapy was developed by a psychiatrist um, Harvey Max Chochinov, who practices actually in Manitoba, Canada. Um, and he discovered that there was a strong association between an undermining of dignity and depression, uh, or excuse me, an undermining of dignity and the experience of depression, anxiety, desire for death, hopelessness, and feeling of a burden. So he maintains that if we can promote dignity, whatever that means for the person you're working with, again, we may have our own ideas about dignity, but whatever that means for the person we're working with is a really important thing to try to promote in our, our, our work with, with our patients. So he developed a, a program that is pretty structured, but what I have found in my work is that you can use parts of this in your work with patients that can be really helpful. So they have a whole dignity psychotherapy question protocol. If you Google dignity therapy, that you can have access to all of this. Plus, plus this is being recorded, of course, and you can refer back to it. But it's, it's things that you may already be doing some of, which is tell me a little bit about your life history, particularly the, the parts you think are most important. And one of the questions that I think is really powerful that we may all wanna ask ourselves actually is, when did you feel most alive? When did you feel most alive? And so when you, when you say, well, tell me a little bit about your life history um, and what are the things that are most important, people may talk about their livelihoods, they may talk about some of their roles like being a parent or a grandparent, but what are the times you felt most alive? And people will tell us things like, oh my gosh, the birth of my children. Um, or it may be 
being in the middle of, for me, being in the middle of um, South Africa and in Malawi and being in, in a game reserve where I saw elephants in the wild, you know, that, that's pretty exhilarating. It may be different life experiences that just were so exhilarating for us. Um, and then in this particular model, uh, Trichinov's group asks, are there specific things that you would want your family to know about you and to remember. Now in Chochenov's model, they transcribe this, they record everything and they transcribe it. They give it back to the person who is sick and then they, they give it to the family as a, a legacy. And there are other ways that we can do that that I'll talk about as well that aren't quite as labor intensive. But these are some of the questions you can ask. What do you want your family to know and to remember? And then I follow it with the question, have you told them? Because sometimes they're sitting with some of the things they want their family to know, but they haven't told them. And perhaps you can help them write some of that down. Other questions are, what are the most important roles you played in life? Why were they so important to you? And what do you think you accomplished? You know, are there things that, that you did that really you're so proud of because you made a difference in your particular work environment or in your family or in your community, in your parish life, whatever it might have been? And what are those accomplishments and what do you feel most proud of? Um, those are some things that, again, according to Chochenov, can really promote a sense of dignity and worth even when a person is seriously ill. Other things are, are there particular things you feel still need to be said to your loved ones? Or things that you want to take the time to say once again, again, Ira Bayak, you know, I love you, I forgive you, um, I'm sorry, um, do you forgive me? You know, those are some of the things that, those are those un, unreconciled or unresolved uh, things that haven't been said. You know, like my neighbor's father, you know, who needed desperately to feel forgiven for what he had done. Another thing that can help create legacy are hopes and dreams for your loved ones. What do you hope for them? You know, do you hope that they will go on to experience joy or to accomplish some of the things that they, they dream about? Um, and then another piece around legacy is what have you learned about life that you want to pass on to others? You know, there's some real wisdom out there with the people that we're working with that are, can be a really, really wonderful thing um, to, to learn about. Uh, other, um, other th uh oh, okay, there we go. Um, and then uh, I kind of on the same lines, what advice or guidance would you wish to pass along to others? Uh, it might be, don't work so hard. <laughs> it might be, don't forget to smell the roses and experience some joy. And then are there words or perhaps instructions that you'd like to offer your family to help them prepare for the future? Um, and then Chochenov, because he's transcribing this document is in creating this record, are there other things that you'd like to have included? Now, this is one way to create dignity and, and create a lasting legacy. What we're talking about here is creating meaning in living and in dying. There are other things you can do as well, depending on your role, you know, if you're a hospice volunteer, if you're a social worker, you know, even if you're doing bedside nursing or a physician, palliative care physician doing a visit, you can ask some of these questions and you can, you know, ask if there's still joy that they're experiencing. But if you are at the bedside and have some additional time, you might wanna help people write a letter to their loved ones. You might want to help people assemble a photo albums if you have time for that. I had a young, young patient who was dying some years ago who had, was leaving behind a three-year-old and her whole support group helped create a photo album for this little boy so that he could know his mom and his mom's life. So there are a lot of things that you can do around legacy. It doesn't have to be a permanent document or in writing. If you have the time to do that, that's a great thing. Some people create videos as a way of saying goodbye or photographs. Um, but even if you're just asking the question, what was meaningful in your life this week? How was the visit with your family? Did you get to tell your daughter how much you loved her? Those kinds of things that help create uh, that sense of, of, of purpose and legacy. So some of the ways that we contribute to hopefulness despite end of life, 
are simply being present, showing up, being compassionate, being kind. But I think some of the other things that we do are to give accurate information presented in a compassionate manner, not false hope. So over the years, uh, when patients have looked me in the eye as a non-physician and asked me, do you think I may die of my disease? I try to answer honestly, even though it's hard. And I'll try to say, I'll say, I don't know. Um, but I will say that it doesn't look as promising as we had once hoped. And I can say that after years and years and years in the field. But um, you can always say, I don't know. Um, but who do we need to ask to get for more information? We also contribute to hope by being very caring, showing up in the room with compassion, with warmth, with genuineness, um, with humor when it's appropriate. And again, giving people the chance to tell their stories and promote their dignity. Other things that foster hope are making sure we're paying attention to people's symptoms. Uh, even if you're a hospice volunteer and not a, a nurse or a physician, you can see if somebody's really distressed and it's really important to let somebody on the team know that. Um, and it, or if you feel like their pain is unrelieved or it, they let slip that they aren't actually taking their pain medicines, you may want to share that with your team to make sure that we can adequately address symptoms that are unrelieved. Fostering relationships, that too can be a really important thing. Assistance in attaining practical goals as is possible. In hospice, uh, we used to try to help people achieve some of their last dreams. I remember one guy wanted one last trip to Cannon Beach and to sit on the beach in his wheelchair and eat one last lunch at Moe's Clam Chowder. And we were able to pull that off, which was, was really exciting. Exploring spiritual beliefs. Again, you know, what are some of the things that you derive comfort from with your, your faith practices? Or conversely, are there things that you feel are unresolved? And then also naming some of the attributes that you recognize in, in that person. One of the palliative care physicians that I work with who uh, was just deeply, deeply compassionate would often say to her patients something that she observed in them, such as they seemed really determined, they seemed really filled with grace, they seemed courageous, uh, they seemed serene. And she would offer that and she'd say, thank you for that, because it gives me uh, such pleasure to work with you. And I feel honored to have that opportunity. And then encouraging lightheartedness when it's appropriate. Um, you know, I had a patient years ago who um, had a pretty rare, uh, what's called a chondrosarcoma, which rendered her paralyzed from the neck down. And her husband was studying to be um, a funeral director, and they happened to live upstairs from the funeral um, funeral um, agency, Little Chapels of the Chime, and she would tell me, don't you think that's handy that we live upstairs? And, you know, at, at first blush, that seemed kind of, um, you know, horrifying, but but she just she just rolled with it. And I went to visit her at, at the end of life when, when she was no longer really interacting. And sure enough, she rallied and she uh, woke up and she called me and said, Susan, I'm not dead. Would you come back? <laughs> and, you know, those kinds of things there, depending on who your person is, we can encourage light, lightheartedness when it's appropriate. I, one of my support groups for people with um, life limiting illnesses talked about living past their expiration dates and wondering how they should navigate that. Should they spend all their money or not? You know, those kinds of things. And then affirming, of course, the worth of the person by treating them as a very valued individual and recalling uplifting memories with Life Review. Why is that important? Well, I think all of us know that it's important because by listening to our patients' stories, by paying careful attention to the language that's being used, a number of outcomes can result. Um, I think our patient care will improve. And I think a sense of meaning will evolve, not only for our, the patients, but also for their families and truthfully for us as well. Patient prov professional communication will improve. And I would suggest satisfaction with our work will improve as well. 
However, I, this is really hard work. It's painful work. It's not work that everybody can do. We know that we can and do see very unfair things happen to people who don't deserve it. We see suffering that may not always be relieved. Um, and we see sometimes people uh, for whom death seems to come too soon. The young parent that doesn't get to see their child through childhood uh, or any number of other examples that, that we can recall that just seem particularly unjust. So I really have come to believe that some of the things that are really, really important personally uh, to be able to work with the dying long term is to examine our own beliefs about death. Um, I have our medical students and our social work graduate students do some exercises that really challenge us to think about what we believe. Uh, yeah, I team, team teach a class for first year medical students on living with life limiting illness. And one of the first questions we ask them right out of the gate, first year medical students, is what do you think happens when people die? And that's a pretty deep question that most of us don't have a really clear answer for. Or if we do, we hope it's true <laughs> when it happens. Um, and I also believe, in addition to examining our own beliefs about death, tolerating, being able to tolerate, not fixing things is really important. The mistake I think some people make in working with serious illness is rushing to fix things, rushing to answer the patient's questions that are really up to them to answer, as I mentioned earlier. Things like, why is this happening to me? You know, uh, why do I have to suffer? We, that is not our, ours to answer. We can, we can in fact shift it to them and say, why do you think this is happening to you? What might be helpful uh, as we work through this? But we've also got to be able to tolerate that the fact that we're not always gonna relieve pain, provide all the answers to the questions. And sometimes we have to sit with suffering and that's painful. Um, it also, I believe, really requires a compassionate presence. Vaclav Havel, who was not only a Czechoslovakian poet, but became their prime minister, said that hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. I remember uh, uh, two people in one of my support groups that were such unlikely friends. Uh, one was a woman in her 40s, African-American, with two teenage boys. She was so fearful about leaving them behind as she was dying. And she befriended a young, white, 27-year-old. And the two of them became fast friends and walked each other to uh, the end of their lives as they talked about trying to make sense, regardless of how this turns out. And they died within about 24 hours of one another. It was really an amazing thing to witness. But the other thing we can do as we do this kind of work is see beyond the illness. It's one of the most important things we can do for our patients. When I do retreats on the weekend, we don't start by asking illness stories. We ask by tell, starting with the question, tell us who you are apart from your illness. Again, that goes back to the roles that we've played, perhaps some of our livelihood, our relationships, those kinds of things. So we too can see beyond the illness as one of the most meaningful gifts that we can give to the person with a serious illness. And again, Frankel said, man, and I would add women are destroyed, not destroyed by suffering, but destroyed by suffering without a sense of meaning. So I come back to my friend, Bobby. What was it about her that allowed her to die with such grace? You know, I, I hope after years and years of working with people with, with life-limiting illnesses, that when it's my turn, I can pay attention to their lessons and die with some grace myself, but there's no guarantee about that. I fear I'll be one of those ungrateful people hurling my, um, my, my food across the room at my well-intended caregivers. I hope that's not the case, but I apologize in advance if it is. But Bobby, Bobby taught us all to sit in the present. Her daughter said, as I look around my family, I see that this has all been openings and more openings for everyone involved the kind with no clear beginning or end, but everything will in time go back to normal, but we've been cracked open enough to let the light come through, no matter how wide or narrow our space for it might be. 
She's a writer and pretty profound. She's done a lot of writing about her mom's end of life experience and the impact on the family. Um, but part of what she was talking about is we, we are forever changed in both difficult but also powerful ways by doing this work, by walking the journey with seriously ill people. Leonard Cohen said, there's a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in. And I find that to be incredibly, incredibly hopeful. So Martha Miller wrote, maybe all that one can do is to is hope to end with all the right regrets. And, and with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and thank you for, for listening. Thank you so much, Susan. That was really great. Uh, so we are going to continue on. Uh, those of you who would like to stay for a question answer period, um, you're welcome to. And those that need to drop off, uh, you can do that as well. So um, if you would like, you can uh, raise your hand and um, either I or Susan, I guess I'll um, keep the lookout for hands, or you can write a question in the chat. So uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions for Susan. Susan, um, Louisa said it would be great if the exercises could be shared with us or some links for self-exploration and exploration. We, we were thinking, uh, you know, PowerPoint, that sort of thing. And uh, somebody pointed out, no, I think that it's possible that she was asking for self-reflection activities for students. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would be happy. I, I'd be happy to put, whoops. I think we have a little bit of feedback going in. Um, I'd be happy to put that together for this group. One of the things that I've been really involved with during the pandemic is um, a, a lot of attempt to take care of, of healthcare providers during this incredibly difficult time. And so I'll put together, uh, Angela, for you, um, a, a, a list of resources related to both um, self-reflection around end of life care and we're doing this kind of work, but also just in general, some references around how we care for ourselves while caring for others. Uh, this has been one of the rockiest times I can remember in all of my years of working in healthcare and the number of presentations I've been asked to give to providers on, on, on grief. Uh, is, is pretty significant. And it's not just grief following the death of someone that we care for, but it's all the losses, big and small, that we've all experienced during the pandemic. So I'll send all that out to you, Angela. Great. So we have uh, Anne, if you want to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, I was just wondering what your experience um, or your opinion about might be about the use of psychedelics for um, death anxiety. That is such a great question, Anne. That is such a great question. Uh, it is an emerging field. Um, we are just barely beginning to study it. Um, I have a colleague up at the University of Washington who uh, has done a total pivot from his palliative care work to study this. Mm -hmm. And he's actually has one of the only teeny, teeny studies using psilocybin with healthcare professionals. Uh, I, this, this, I will tell, share this with you because I think it's funny. He only had 30 slots and he had 3,000 applicants <laughs> on the part of healthcare, healthcare providers. His theory, and, and I'm not going to be able to ac accurately really convey um, all the, the uh, science and physiology around this, but the idea behind it is your people are trained as a guide. They give the, the person who has the the life limiting illness, uh, a certain amount of psilocybin, and then they stay with the person during that experience and then debrief it with them afterwards. And it's usually a guided sort of journey. Um, my colleague himself went through this and, uh, and just last night, interestingly enough, I referred in the talk to my mentor colleague who died a month ago. And I, I have, a few of us have committed to making sure we take his wife out to dinner every month. And last night was the night. And she told us that her husband had done this. And I said, I asked her, can, can, can you share any of the experience? And she said, it totally shifted his anxiety, totally shifted 
his terror about dying. And what my colleague in at the University of Washington suggests is that unlike our uh, normal antidepressants and anti-anxiolytics that we use, it interrupts the rumination temporarily, but it then once we stop it, it goes back to the rumination. It doesn't correct it. Whereas, and again, here's where I'm in over my skis a bit about the, the biological component, but apparently the psilocybin actually changes that rumination. So you stop the rumination and then you don't go back to it. The reason he wants to do it with healthcare providers is he believes we are really ruminative types that work in this field. <laughs> And so he wants to see if it can help us too. I, I think stay tuned, Anne. It's, I think it's a field that is just barely being explored, but I think it might show, show, it show some promise. Not unlike when we legalized uh, marijuana, one of the psychiatrists I worked with said, now we can finally study it. We can figure out what it works well with and what it doesn't work well with as we isolate the different active components of marijuana. So uh, I think stay tuned. I think it's a fascinating field of study. Thanks for asking the question. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, Charlene. Hi, hello. <laughs> I was just wondering, Susan, your opinion on like um, ending life. Um, so I have, I'm a social worker and I'm working with a, a older gentleman who's spoken about um, just being happy if he woke up and was, you know, wasn't here anymore. He has a degenerative disease, but it's not necessarily a, um, a, a death sentence disease. But I was just wondering what your thoughts are about talking to him about like, you know, stuff like <clears throat> ending, ending life, like euthanasia. I can, yeah. Ooh, Charlene, I wish we had hours and hours to talk about that question. Um, so I, I was appointed to the task force that wrote the guidelines for, for Oregon's Death with Dignity Law uh, 20 years ago um, after we, the voters of Oregon um, voted in favor of this. And I'll tell you what, we, we didn't have a clue what to do because there was nobody to call, nobody to talk to. Uh, euthanasia uh, certainly was not a part of that bill, but as most of you probably know the requirements of the law are a six month prognosis determined by two physicians or providers. Um, a, um, the patient has to have capacity. Uh, they have to make at least two verbal and one written requests. The law was changed this, this last year that if a person was expected to die within the 15 day waiting period, that waiting period could be waived. That was the first modification to the law in 20 years. And I think that um, in general, we've become a little more comfortable with that legislation than we were certainly 20 years ago. Um, however, you raised, Charlene, such an insightful question because where I hear lots and lots of angst is less around the folks in the last window of six months, you know, availing themselves of that um, legal option. Where I hear the angst are around degenerative diseases that lack a prognosis um, and dementias. Um, I was asked to, to speak to a, a group of senior citizens a few years ago about the law and ooh, they were they were hopping mad <laughs> about <laughs> the restrictions in the law. And they said, we want this law change. I want a provision that if I have dementia, somebody can euthanize me. And that's not how the law is written. One has to be capable. There are very, very clear arguments for uh, not doing that. Um, and the, the clearest one around the field of ethics is the slippery slope. You know, some of you may remember Kevorkian, who was doing his own version of death with dignity without assessing people and uh, without a team. And so that was very controversial. Now, Canada, on the other hand, has um, uh, a provision through their, um, uh, it's not their legislature, I'm, I'm, I'm blocking the name of it. It's their their leadership group federally. Um, and they, they have made it a provision that euthanasia is legal. Uh, and it's super controversial. I happened to be in Canada 
uh, to talk about all of this very early after their enactment of it. It also happened to be the day that Trump was declared our new president and that's a whole other <laughs> conversation, you know, of being in another country when that happened. That was an interesting experience. Anywho, um, um, but they, they would say that there are people just like the gentleman you're describing, Charlene, that uh, want to avail themselves of limiting their life. And I, I think it's, I think it's, layered with ethics, it's layered with values, it's layered with self-determination, and it's complicated. And I wish I had a clear answer for you. <laughs> it is, that's what it, so it's complicated. I am in Canada and he actually ha, um, is a senior who was homeless until we got involved. And um, so his legacy too, it, is in, not in question, but he just doesn't feel like there's, a lot and and you know he doesn't have family and um i do think it's a quality of life thing for him like he was he's a person who's who's social on when he was homeless in the streets and that's that was his joy in life and now he can't walk and hardly can talk and um I just don't know if I, like you know how to broach that conversation since since I am one of like not me necessarily like our team of social workers here people are people he trusts and even that he has as his emergency contact so it would be some it would be us first bef before even a physician or 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 loved ones that he might have this conversation with that but yeah it's 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 sticky and um sure, it's, it's tough. I, I I would suggest a couple of things. I would suggest lean into the questions, go mm -hmm. toward it, go toward it. You know, mm -hmm. you clearly are, are one of the people he trusts. Um, you may want to couch some of it in his quality of life. Like you said, your quality of life was living on the streets. Your quality of life was being able to have this whole social engagement with your people. What has it been like for you to not have that? And, and ask more questions about what, creates suffering for him. Um, and, and so I think that will give you a lot of information and it may not give you uh, an answer relative to, you know, should he end his life or not, but it will give him your sense of presence that you want to hear right. his story and that matters to him. And, and what I've discovered in going toward these conversations is that, that some, some people just need to talk about it. And they may never take it further than that. They just need to know that they have a safe place to talk about it. So I'd encourage you to really lean into it. Okay, that's really great. This has really been helpful. Um, my approach before was to try to give hope and things, but um, I, I think the conversation needs to go into a different direction. Great, yeah, yeah go deeper, lean mm -hmm. into it, lean yeah. into the pain. Um, and you, in the you. chat, we've seen uh, that End of Life Choices will be the next presenter. I'm gonna do a little advertising for you here, Angela. And then, um, and also talks about, there's always uh, the voluntary stopping of eating and drinking, which is uh, another option. And I think in addition to all of that is, is exactly what you just said, uh, Charlene is taking maybe a different direction. Um, Maria uh, put in the chat that, what about special considerations for LGBTQ, especially if partners are not legally recognized? I just gave a lecture to one of our uh, community mental health classes the other day on uh, the social determinants of mental health. And one of the things we know is that uh, some of the social determinants of, of health and mental health are influenced by poverty, race, LGBTQT folks are particularly uh, vulnerable to depression, uh, suicidality prior to uh, dealing with serious illnesses. But it's also important to remember that um, marginalized communities often are less well cared for in our health systems. They may experience bias, they may experience racism, they may experience um, their partners not being recognized. Um, and so one of the things that, that I will try to do um, if a person identifies as LBGBQT and they have a partner, but they have not designated them as their surrogate decision maker or legally transferred any like financial power of attorney or anything like that, I encourage them to take those steps because we know that not all of our health systems are going to honor um, a domestic partnership or 
uh, a non-traditional relationship. And so if there aren't legal rights and a person is no longer able to speak for themselves, it will default to the order of legal decision-making. So it might be uh, a parent, it might be a sibling, it might be an adult child, and that may not be the person who represents that patient's desires. Um, one of my team members works in our inpatient acute bone marrow transplant unit. And even if people aren't ready to fill out their advanced directives, particularly people with acute leukemia, um, she makes sure they designate their surrogate decision maker because often in the course of transplantation, they may go in and out of the ICU or become um, lack competence even temporarily or lack capacity rather. So having that person designated, I think is really important and particularly important for people who have less traditional relationships uh, in order to be recognized as the legal sur surrogate in those situations. Thanks for that question. Are there any other questions that participants have? Thanks for being such an engaged group. I hope this has been somewhat useful for you. Um, and I have a little bit of homework to pull together both some death awareness, uh, self-reflections, as well as um, some resources to, to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves while doing this difficult, but really important work. So thanks again for having me, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Susan, so much. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, register for the upcoming uh, classes. Uh, we have the 15th and on every Wednesday in June. Okay, well, thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Susan.